Amen. God is good all the time. God is good. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, don't have wet wood. You can turn to Philippians chapter 3. We're going to continue talking about momentum this morning. Before we do, I just, the Lord really impressed upon me for somebody, hopefully it's for a lot, a lot of us re- relates, but in the middle of worship, this, the Lord just put this phrase on me, and it's, it's this, God sees you, and, and I don't know who that's for, I don't know if they're watching, I don't know if it's in the house, but the truth is, God sees you, and that's two parts, and I'm not going to unfold it, it's just that for some of us, we're hiding, and we're living this life, and we need to know that God sees us. He knows we're here and he's glad, but he, he sees us. But here, here's what was impressed upon me, that there's someone in their life and they, they, feel, they feel alone and they feel like they don't matter and, and you feel like you're just really, you're at this point where we just, you want to give up. And God just says, he sees you. He sees you. So thanks be to God, he sees us and that matters and that's a big deal and just Think on that if that's, if that's for you, and, and I believe the Lord will speak to you through that. Philippians 3, read this last week, and I just feel, didn't feel like we, people responded well, so we're going to do it again. <laughs> no, we are going to open with it again. So it's Paul speaking, and he says, Not that I've already obtained it or have already become perfect, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, somebody say one thing, letting go, forgetting what is behind, and reaching forward toward the goal for the prize of the upward call or the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. So let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you that you see us. We thank you that you help take away our past so that we can let go of it. Lord, I just simply ask that by your Holy Spirit, Father, that we would hear you speak to us today, God, that you would move in our midst, God, that you would encourage us and help us to press on. You would help us gain momentum so that we could live a life that glorifies you. Have your way in this service. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. Amen. So a lot of review this morning, but it's just, uh, we're talking about momentum. And I would say this, how many of you know practice makes perfect? We will be good at something, we got to practice some stuff. Not just believing something or wanting something, but when we start to practice something, whether it's in life, it's in sports, it's in business, it's also in our spiritual lives. There are practices and things that we can do that will help us get better, that will help us gain momentum. We've been talking about momentum. Momentum simply is this, an energy, a force, or a movement going in a direction. Momentum is when something begins to go. It's, it's like a car that's been sitting on, uh, on top of this hill, and, and it get it over the top, and it begins to go. And as it goes downhill, it begins to gain momentum. So the Lord wants our lives, once we start to walk and live in Him, that we would begin to gain momentum. Why do we need momentum? So that we can continue on the journey that God has for us to, towards His purposes and His plans. And if we can be honest, we would say that sometimes it feels like this journey has a lot of uphill. Amen? So we need momentum to help carry us, to get us over the top, get us over this hump, get us through this this tough season so that we can keep going. Our theme this year that we've been talking about is is epic. God is epic. Epic is heroic. It's majestic. It's, It's spectacular. It's something that's glorious. So we understand that God is epic. He's not just a little bit. We need to take our blinders off and realize that there are no limits with God. And in Christ, in the Father, that we are called to live epic lives. That doesn't mean that we're in our self-glorious, spectacular, do anything fancy, but when we live for Him, it releases Him to make Himself known epically, so to speak, to a world that we live in. And we find out it's hard to live epic. It's hard to walk this journey when we don't have any momentum. So we've discussed some things talking about momentum. We've discussed giving what we have to God. In 2 Kings chapter 4, the the, the widow comes to Elisha, and she says, I don't have anything, I need your help, I have nothing, and Elisha wasn't concerned with that, and he says, what do you have? In other words, I'm not concerned with what you don't have, and we talked about giving what we do have to God. 
whether it be a whole lot or it be just a little bit, that when we give what we have to God, that it's more than enough. We have to give what we have to God. Secondly, we talked about not letting the blessings or the things in our life keep us from following God. We talked about the rich young ruler. He had some stuff, and he comes to Jesus, and he says, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? What do I have to do to walk with, in your plans? And Jesus says, well, they had a conversation, and finally Jesus says, well, you need to give some of your stuff away, and the bottom line is you need to follow me. It's in following Jesus that we go on. If we're not willing, if we're held back by the blessings, how many of you know that sometimes we let the good things in our life keep us from the best? God blesses our life. God saves us. God gives us some stuff, gives us abilities to do some things in our life. But instead of going on with God, we're too busy sometimes hanging on to what we have, and it keeps us and it holds us back from going the direction and going the way the Lord would have us go. Then we talked about Moses believing God when he encountered uh, God in the burning bush. And simply, you and I, we need to learn to believe at a higher level. Amen? We can believe that Jesus died for us. We can believe that he loves us. But sometimes we come to a roadblock. We come to a situation. And it's like, whoa, I don't know if I can believe God for this. And we're listening and we're believing all the other stuff that we're hearing instead of simply believing God so that he can do what he wants to in our life. And of course, last week, the scripture we read today, we simply talked about pressing on. There's sometimes that you and I just have to grit our teeth a little bit, take a step of faith, and just keep pressing on. We have to learn how to, this is human nature, to hang on to stuff because it's been hanging on to us for so long, but letting go of this stuff back here so that I can reach forward to the stuff that I have that God has for me going forward. I can't reach for it if I'm holding on to this other stuff. So I begin to think, some of us might say, you know what, I've heard some of your messages. I hear what you're saying, and, and I've been trying to apply this stuff, and I'm trying to press on, and it's, it's difficult, but I'm trying. I hear you. I'm trying to press on. But I still just feel like I don't have a lot of momentum. Anybody ever just still feel like you don't have a lot of momentum? Me and Jack, we're the only one. So I begin to think this week, I begin to think, well, are there some things that we could do on a daily basis? Things that we can just, just apply to our life that we could use. And so I begin to think, and the Lord took me back to our, our youth camp this summer. And I begin to think about all the decisions that were made and all the salvations. I begin to think about how God moved in, in the middle of this camp. I begin to think about walk to Emmaus. I begin to think about how, how that affects people. I begin to think about retreats and men's conferences and women's conferences. And I begin to think about how people experience God in these settings and, and we get on fire. And so we come back, and we'll plug into a church, which is really what a lot of those things are created to do, and we begin to get plugged into church, and, and, and we have tons of momentum. And we're ready to charge the, water, the, the gates of hell with a water gun, and, and we're going to save the world, and we are on fire, but then life happens, amen? And something comes up in my life, and it wasn't expected, and it wasn't fair, and it wasn't even maybe my fault. And so all of a sudden, I go from this stream of living water that's rolling down the hill, begin to dry up from this flowing living thing, and I become this stale, stagnant, drying up old tank that nobody wants to drink out of, and nobody wants to go hang out at. And so I begin to think, well, maybe there's some things at these places that we could look at, camp, walk to mass, retreat, conferences. Could we learn something? I mean, what happened in these places? Because it's not the place, Tyler spoke of that, it's not necessarily the place we're at, but it's, it's knowing that God's everywhere. He's all around us. That He is in all places and all things, and He wants to be a part of us. So, so what's changed? Our location has changed. But are there things that, that we did in some of these experiences that we could apply to our daily lives? So for the next, this today, and, and maybe next week, we're going to look at some godly disciplines, somebody say disciplines, <laughs> that maybe we could use or we could apply in our life, that we can do anywhere. And so the first one I'm going to talk to you about today is just very simply is this, it's fellowship. Somebody say fellowship. Fellowship where there is unity. 
fellowship where we're gathered with people that are going the same direction, that are striving for the same things. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25. It says, and let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and to good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, as many have the habit of doing, but yet coming and encouraging one another, and even all the more as you see the day drawing near. Now, God's saying this, man. Church is a blessing, and church is a gift, and gathering together with other like-minded believers, it ought to be a blessing. And we've turned it in our culture where it's something, well, we have to do, or I really should do that, or, you know, maybe it'll whatever, whatever. And we don't understand the benefit that we have. And we don't commit to it. You know, we're still operating in feelings. Well, I don't feel like going to church, or I can just sit and watch it on Facebook. Now, I don't have to actually go to church, and I really don't like being around people uh, anyway. So we're missing out on a blessing And the enemy's putting these excuses in our brain of why why we don't need to commit to be a part of a fellowship. Coming together with other people that are focused on Christ and his kingdom. Where we can find encouragement and check it out. So that we can also begin to encourage someone else. It's so easy. Can we be real? It's so easy to get out of the habit of coming together. It's so easy to get out of the habit of going to my church. It's so easy to get out of the habit of going, spending with my brothers and sisters to have a little accountability. So what happens is I don't get encouraged, and I don't get to encourage anyone else. And we all need encouragement. Can I get a witness? And we're all called to encourage someone else. And as a matter of fact, if we would be more focused on encouraging someone else, we're going to find out that it's going to encourage us even as we do just that. But what happens is when I begin to be someone that's encouraging someone else, all of a sudden people are going to say, hey, I see how you're an encourager and now I want to encourage you because I'm seeing how God is using your encouragement to bless someone else. And I just want you to know that you encourage me by the way you're encouraging. And so here begins this cycle where I encourage and I get encouraged by doing it. And I'm also doubly encouraged because somebody else is going to be provoked to encourage me as well. Do you understand that when we go on a walk to Emmaus or we go to a, 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 a youth camp or we go to a retreat, that we're surrounded by people that are committed to encourage us. They're committed to, no matter how you act, no matter how snooty you are, no matter what you do, they're committed under the hand of God to encourage you, to draw you closer to Christ so that you may experience His love. And you realize how much time we spend in our lives around people that are unbelievers, or at least they're not focused on what we're focused on, whether it's at work, or, or just in our daily life, and, and we're hearing all this stuff, and, and everything we're doing in our job so many times, I mean, it's just the way it is. got to focus on work, but we're not focused on the Lord. And so we're, we're in the middle of all this other stuff and all these other relationships, and we don't realize how badly we need to be around brothers and sisters of like-minded who are serving the kingdom of God. Amen? We're, 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 we're separated. God's everywhere, but we don't realize that Christ is in our presence. And we need to come together with someone else. That's why as simple as it is, Matthew 18, 20, so powerful. It says, for where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there also. We can come together during the middle of the week. I can have fellowship and, you know, spend a little time with one of my buddies, you know, and, and the presence of God is there. And we begin talking about what the Lord's doing in our life, talking about, can you imagine talking about the message and what God said on ch- at church on Sunday? Can you believe that God said he sees us? Wow, just think about it. I mean, you can have these moments where it's not officially church, but we're having this intimate fellowship with brothers and sisters in Christ where Jesus is present and it begins to enrich our life and it turns our focus off all the junk and all the stuff and all the negativity and we begin to focus on the goodness of God. Romans 12 10 it says be devoted to one another in brotherly love and give preference to one another. Give preference to one another. 
lifting somebody else, giving somebody else uh, the first in line. Let you go before me. Let me hold the door for you. I'm lifting you up. I'm more focused today on you than I am in me. How many times do we go to come to church? Can we be real? And we want to know how this is going to bless me. I want to know what I'm going to get out of it. Well, I'm going to know what the message. What if we came to church and I'm thinking, I'm going to be devoted to someone else. I'm going to be an encourager of someone else. I want to lift somebody else up above me. What if we all came to the house of God thinking, not what can I get out of it? What do I need? What does God owe me? What does somebody else ought to do for me? And we come to the house of God and we're thinking, how can I lift someone else up? How? What if we all did that and we all started lifting each other up? Yes, you can. Yes, you are, love. Yes, God does see you. Yes, you can make it through this transition. Yes, your marriage is going to work. Yes, your kids are going to become something. What if? And we all begin to build each other up. What if we had real relationships? What if we came to church and we, we, we got real with each other? What if we had these relationships in our lives that we could be real and honest? Because honestly, this is what happens with most people, even in church, where sometimes in the world is we begin to put up walls because we feel like no one loves the real me. And if you see the real me, you're not going to like me. And if you see the real me, you're not going to want to hear me on Sunday. Are you with me? And so we put up these walls, and here's the point of coming together and not letting it slip away. We need relationships where we, we, we want to honor each other and where we can be real in a safety place where we can just be us, where we know we're going to be accepted, where we know we're going to be loved, and then we can begin to build something better. Amen? When we come together. Proverbs 27, 17. As iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. We need relationships. We need Christ fellowship just because it makes us better. It sharpens us a little bit. It makes us more effective. Being around people that love us and accept us like the Lord does, it makes us better. But not only love and acceptance, but some accountability. How many of you know you need accountability? I need accountability. We need to give an answer sometimes. We're all going to give an answer on the day we come before the Lord. We need to, people in our life not to put us down, but that we can be real enough and honest enough. And we shared enough last week where we can talk this week. Well, how did you do in this area? Well, how did you treat your wife this week? Well, how is this going at work? What is it? I don't know what it is, but we need accountability. We want to be around people that are trying to do the same thing we are, not playing church, not showing up to check the box, but actually trying to make progress. This is real momentum where we're going somewhere. Because I, want to, I don't know about you, but I like being around people that are better than me. Better at me at the things that I do. Better at me at my hobbies. Better at me at my job. Better at me at preaching and doing church. Because what does it do? It helps me get better. It raises the task. It pushes us. It guides us. It convicts us. It sharpens us. It encourages us. Look at somebody and say, somebody, you need to get together with people. <laughs> Two are better than one, amen? Two are better than one when they're going the same direction. The second one is this. Number two is this. Prayer. Somebody say prayer. Prayer is very simply this. It's communication with our Father and Creator of all things. Can you imagine that? God Himself gives us access to Him through His Son, Jesus Christ, where we can communicate with Him, where we can talk to Him, Prayer does a lot of things. This is going to be abbreviated on prayer. But prayer activates the power of God. How many of you sometimes say, I need a little bit more power in my life? We know God's got power. We know he can do anything. But prayer activates the power of God. There's a scripture that we all know that I'll use because we're familiar with it. 2 Chronicles seven fourteen. It says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, Turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sins, and restore their land. God says, I can restore you. I can heal it. I can do something here. But there's a prerequisite. You're going to have to talk to me about it. You're going to have to admit it. You're going to have to own it. You're going to have to listen to me. And there may be some things when you're listening to me that you're going to realize that you need to change in your life. See, prayer is talking. Prayer is also listening. And understanding that when we pray, it moves the hand of God. It, it, it empowers things. The scripture in, a, in Ephesians 6, it talks about the armor of God. 
And, and it says, when you've done all you can do to stand, then stand some more. And put on the, the, the whole armor of God. Put on the breastplate of righteousness, and the helmet of salvation, the belt of truth, your feet, feet shod with the gospel, the sword of the Spirit in your hand. And so it says, put all this armor of God on, and we need to be armored. We don't need to leave the house without the armor of God on. We need to like walk going around the fire naked. We need the armor of God on our lives. But then it says in verse 18, it says you need to pray. You need to pray at all times. You need to be ready. And in other words, it's saying this. You can put on the armor of God, but until you turn it on, it's just going to be a heavy suit. But when you begin to pray, all of a sudden this armor comes to life. And now all of a sudden I can deflect the, the arrows that are thrown at me. I can draw the sword of the Spirit. I can be an effective instrument in the hand of God. When I begin to pray, it turns it on. And this is what the enemy does. The enemy wants God's people to think that we can't pray. He wants us to think that I'm not good enough to pray, and I don't know how to pray, and I don't pray like he does or she does. Have you heard them pray? There's no way I can pray like that. My prayers won't work. There's no use for me even to pray to God. And I just simply want to tell some of us today that praying is not hard. Praying is being honest with God. And you know what else? It doesn't take big requirements. You didn't have to go to church. You didn't have to never miss a Sunday for six months. You didn't have to go to seminary to pray. You, don't, you barely have to even believe. You don't even have to believe to pray. It helps so your prayers will be heard and effective. But I'm just saying this. It's not hard to pray. Matthew 6, 7 says, And when you are praying, do not use meaningless repetition and go on and on, as some of the Gentiles do, for they suppose they will be heard by their many words. He's, Jesus himself said this. Just talk to God. You don't have to change your voice. Have you ever been around them people? I've, I've known people. Seriously. You know, like they're preachers or whatever, and you see them, and you're talking, man. You're talking about the rain. Yeah, man, it's dry. Boy, we need, you know, this. And you're just talking about life. And then all of a sudden, you ask them about church, or you ask them to pray over the meal, and all of a sudden, their, their tone just changes. Bless God, we just thank you today and beseech you today that you put up with us. You know what I mean? You don't have to do that stuff. You just talk to him. He knows who you are. He sees you where you're at. And we just begin to talk to him. You know what, God? I'm so thankful that you see me today. And I'm so thankful that you love me and that you save me. But God, really, I've got some stuff going on in my life. And it's difficult right now. And I'm really struggling. I could use your help. You know what? That's a powerful prayer. That is an effective prayer. You know, I mean, it's just starting off simply talking to God if we would anyone else. When we pray, it brings peace. Anybody ever need peace? It brings peace in our life. Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Be anxious about nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, thanksgiving to God, let your request be known. In other words, just pray to God and check it out. And the peace of God, which doesn't make sense, passes all understanding, will guard our hearts and our minds. When we simply spend a moment in prayer with the Lord, He can actually give us peace. He gives us peace because we're reminded in these moments that He sees us, that he loves us, that he cares about what we're doing, what we're, what we're going, on, going on in our life. And praying brings us, gives strength to us. It brings strength to us when we pray. Jude, Jude 20. It says, but you building yourselves up in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. Praying to God builds us up. He's telling you, you know what? Sometimes you don't have to be in the middle of a church service, even though that's good to be a part of. Sometimes if you find yourself alone, just begin praying to yourself. You see, sometimes we want other people to strengthen us, other people to lift us up. And if we have healthy relationships in a good church, that's going to happen. But there's still times where we have to know how to build ourselves up. Anybody with me? Anybody had one of them weeks and you're out there on the farm? You're out there dealing with what it is. It's broke down. It don't work. This thing at work, it's wearing you out. It's not fair. And we need these moments where we can just build ourselves up. I love the story about David in 1 Samuel chapter 30. And David finds himself, and he's greatly distressed. The people, they're wanting to stone him. They're wanting to come against him. And it says this, but David strengthened himself in the Lord. Other people weren't coming to him, tell him how great he was and how awesome a job he was doing and, 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 and doing everything for him. It was just David. He was just in this spot, and he was wore out, and he just about had it. But instead, it says he strengthened himself. 
He knew the promises of God. He knew what God had declared over his life. And he just began to strengthen himself so that he could continue to go on. You know this, but camps and walks and retreats and conferences, they're surrounded in prayer. They're surrounded for months leading up to it where people are praying, focused on that time that God would meet people in in that place and move in our lives. Prayer is simply this. It's communicating to God. How many of you know communication is crucial in relationships? Can I get a witness? And we struggle with it. Communication is crucial in our marriages, in our friendships, in our parenting, in our work. And it certainly is with God. When communication lines break down, we're going to struggle. That relationship's going to struggle. So it is with God. And we, can we be real? Most of us stink at communication. We do. And it's getting worse and worse in this techno age that we live in. And now we're texting and we're emailing and we're dealing with the social media messages and all this stuff and you know, where we can just be however we want to be and say whatever we want to say without looking across the, the, in, in somebody's eye, and we, we're, not, we, we're losing our ability to communicate. And so then we hurt because we're, we're our, in our communication, we're not dealing. Think about in a marriage. When we don't communicate well, well, he ought to know what I want. And she's saying, what does she want? I have no idea what she wants. I'm trying to do this, and, 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 we, and we're not communicating. Sometimes a man needs to know, what do you want me to do? We have to, that's an example, but... The men know what I'm talking about right here. And it happens through communication. When we communicate with each other. And the same with the Lord. We have to have real communication which leads to number three. Number three is communion. This is deep communication. But communion in itself is simply this thought of in the church. It's a celebration of the Eucharist. Celebration of the body and the blood of Jesus. His body was beaten. His body was pierced for our transgressions. His blood was poured out, shed upon a cross for the forgiveness of sins. We can read in 1 Corinthians 11 when Paul's giving this to the Corinthians. And he said, when Jesus had given thanks, he broke the bread and said, This is my body. Do this in remembrance of me. The same way after supper he took the cup. This is my blood. It's the blood of the new covenant. Do this in remembrance of me. As often as you eat this and drink this, you remember me. You proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Communion is so powerful. It's a time of remembering. And it's also a time of celebrating what Jesus has done for us. This is what lights a fire on our wet wood. This is what gets us going. When it re- we remember how Jesus took our place. When we remember how he was whipped for my transgressions. When we remember how he was on display for the world to see and he was judged by man. And yet he did it and his blood runs out to forgive us of our sins. What a powerful time. When we just begin to focus on the cross. That's why the cross is so powerful. When we set on our eyes on a hill, hill where our help comes from. It's Jesus hanging on the cross it's about us accepting his sacrifice that he did that for me and when I partake of this thing that I'm also giving his life giving my life to him and now this life I live would be lived in a way that glorifies him when we take communion it can be eye-opening it can bring revelation into our lives when we see us under the shadow of him we see our lives or sometimes it's it's a conviction Sometimes I remember the things that I'm doing that I shouldn't be doing because now I see him high and lifted up over my life. Sometimes it brings revelation and I begin to get understanding that I never did before. Think about the story on the two men on the road to Emmaus in Luke chapter 24 and they're walking with Jesus and they're telling him and they're whining and they're talking about the things that had happened and they didn't realize that this was Jesus. How many times do we walk with the Lord in our lives and we don't realize that he's the one walking with us? And it says that that night they get to the place and they tell him to stay. And in verse 30 and 31 it says, When Jesus took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it, their eyes were open and they recognized him. Communion brings revelation. 
it opens up our eyes and we begin to see the Lord and we begin to see things in our life. Communion is so powerful, but I want to focus the rest of this time just a minute, not long, but about another meaning or a deeper meaning. I mean, you can't get deeper than Jesus and what he did, but to add to that, this meaning of communion, building on top of praying, building on top of fellowship, communion is this, it's fellowship where there is intimate exchange and there's intimate communication where nothing is hidden. It's when we come together with God and we realize in that moment that there's nothing hidden. Or when we fellowship with other people, our, our families, our friends, when there's nothing hidden. And we're simply communicating at this base level on where we're at and what's going on and what God's doing in the middle of it. You see, I want you to see this. The communion is not just a special moment at church, but it can be, we can have regular times of communing with God in the Spirit. Not dependent upon people, not dependent upon location, but it's just these moments when I just get away and I just get in the presence of God and I just say, God, I need to commune with you. I need to be reminded in this moment and I'm praying to you, God, because I need to be reminded of who I am and who you are and what you're calling me to do. Maybe there's a big decision coming up. Maybe there's anxiety and it's pressing in on me and we're wanting to freak out and we're already starting to put stuff on Facebook and we're screaming out to help and we're crying out to friend that I know isn't a good influence instead we ought to be communing for a moment and we ought to be asking God God I need to be in your presence in a way that's going to help lead me out of this and show me the way and be confident that you are ordering my steps as I go I'm just un understand that on top of communion that we're going to celebrate today we can have these moments of communion when it's just me and God in that moment, before I blow a head gasket, before I do something I shouldn't do, and I just begin to commune with God, and maybe I've got some intimate friends, when I can just have these moments and I can reach out to them and we can come together and we can have these un hidden, undisturbed moments. We need to pray. We need to pray. If we want momentum, we're going to have to fellowship. We're going to have to... We're going to have to learn to pray, and we're going to have to learn how to commune with God, enter into his presence, because you're not always going to have somebody serving you communion, okay? And some people say, well, if, if you believe in communion so strong, why don't we do it every time we gather? Well, we probably should, but you know what? I believe this. I believe that when God speaks, when we worship him, I believe that when we open up the altars, I believe this is a place where we commune with God. When we get on our face, on our knees, and so many of us are scared of it because we're afraid somebody's going to see us or whatever, but there is something so powerful when we come to the altars of God, not looking for anything except, God, I need to commune with you today. Are you with me? We can commune with the Lord. So the bottom line is this, we often want others, we want God to do things for us, and there are certain things that we can do to keep our momentum going. We can be a part of positive fellowship. We'll find encouragement, and we get to encourage. And there are disciplines that you and I can do in our life, anytime, any place, anywhere, that will help us continue in our momentum for the Lord. We must do some of these things. We must practice some of these things if we want to continue going with the Lord. So a few questions and I'm done. Do we assemble with other like-minded believers? Are we committed to it? Or are we just, I mean, I, I know you're, we're here today, praise God. But I mean, is this something that we're committed to? Of gathering together and encouraging one another and just simply seeking God no matter what the song service is, no matter what the message, no matter just come to seek the Lord? Do we participate? Listen to me. We can come to church and not be in church. We can come to church and we can avoid everything about church. And we can avoid the people and we can avoid the interactions and we can avoid it. And, and we don't realize we're missing out. God says, I want you to, don't forsake of coming together. Don't miss out. Don't be worried about being the last one in and the first one out. But come and see what God might have for us. Are we active in our prayer life? Do we pray? We talk about praying. We pray in church, but do we pray? 
Do we pray in the middle of our week? Do we pray in the middle of our day? God, just be with me today. Thank you. Whatever. How can we expect momentum in any relationship without communicating? And do we take advantage of communion? Communion that we celebrate like we're going to just in just a second, but also the, the opportunity where we can just speak to God, where we can ask Him, where we can talk to Him, and we can focus on the cross. So the last night, the Lord Jesus was gathered with his disciples. And he took the bread, and he blessed it, and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. After supper was ended, he took the cup, and again he gave thanks. And he says, this is my blood. It's the blood of the new and everlasting covenant which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Each time you eat this bread and drink this cup, this do in remembrance of me. Pray with me. Father, we love you. We thank you for loving us, God. As we come today, God, in fellowship, we come together as this body, God, and we pray, God, that you would speak to us, that you would bring revelation that you would encourage us, that for some of us, Lord, you would, you would show us some things. Like Paul says, you need to examine yourself as you come and partake. God, that you would meet us in this place today. That we would see the value in practicing these things as we come into your presence, God, to help us gain momentum so that we can continue to walk and face and glorify you through whatever we do. Lord, I just simply ask that you would meet us this day as we come and partake of your body and your blood. For it was for us that you died. It was for us that you bled. And it was for us that you rose again. So that we would be forgiven, made new, and alive for your glory. God, if there's anybody here that doesn't know you today, never accepted you, I pray that in this moment you would become to real to them. Their eyes would be open. They would see you dying on a cross for them so that they could live. And they would accept that today. If you've never done that, I want to encourage you to just say, God, I need that. God, I need that. Father, move in this place as we close in worship in Jesus' name. So those who ask the